Malvika, over to you. Thank you, Yo. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our GitHub tutorial, and it's going to be quite hopefully not too much. Please tell me when it's getting too much because that's not our intention. We want to show you the basics that should get you started. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, cool. Let me remove the speaker note I don't need for this. Um, so first of all, if what we have done is ask you to add your name in the etherpad and please do that and keep that order in mind because we're going to make you do some editing online, but not in the etherpad. Um, we want to talk to you about version control and why it's important. Uh, we will tell you what is GitHub. I'm sure you've seen it already, but just have a refresher on that. We will tell you what Markdown is, how we can use that for formatting some files in a very simple way that can make our file looks really nice. And we will do a bit of exercise on README. You've already learned about README in the previous calls where you talk about your project, tell us a bit about what this project does, give all the information. And our aim today would be that in the middle of our training, you're gonna publish them in a website. So sounds, weird but, but we'll see that it's quite easy via github so that's your git page sorry we would we would actually do this this exercise later where we will ask you to make some changes in someone else's github repository and that someone else's github repository will be open life science github repository the reason we ask you to do this exercise or show you how to do it is that part of being an open science or open source is to collaborate with other projects. Um, and you would also see other people collaborating with you in your project. And the GitHub is one of that tool where these collaboration across different projects is quite interesting. I wouldn't say it's very easy. I'm sure it takes some of our practice in order to make that happen, but this would be our aim to ask you to create your website, but also think about how can we go beyond our own project and collaborate with different people. And we will probably show you some feature of GitHub. If we are not going to show you the GitHub feature, there's the slide in the etherpad where you will be able to come back to different things we would love for you to know as you advance in your learning in the GitHub. So collaborative document, we've already seen as we are using etherpad um, that there are some challenges. They're not always great. Um, I would ask you to tell me what these challenges are, but uh, I rather than that, I would ask you to write it in the chat. Can you tell me what are some challenges you faced around collaborative documents? Just a couple would be very cool. Yep, uh, knowing what's being deleted or not. For Microsoft, it solves a lot of problem, uh, similar to get Google document where you actually can go back in the history and see how people comment and collaborate. Yeah, the problem is not everyone's using the same workflow. We all think that we know what we are doing, but often we take different approaches. Different style of organizing work, uh, meaning if there is no guidance or template, it becomes hard for people to see what, what is expected. Keeping version up to date and losing previous versions. So um, in the past, you might have seen, and I'll show you that people used to save multiple version of the same document, but now we don't do that because we can go back in time. Yeah, the naming, right? Like, what does that mean? Final version, use this one, and then something else comes in like version, final, final. So not knowing which document actually is up to date when different people are working. So collaboration in general is very complicated. If you're the only person working on something, you make fast decision. You go on updating when you want to update it. But when you work with distributed people, as in distributed team all across the world, they are working in different time zones, meaning that you wouldn't get response as immediately as you would like. You would like to give people more time to look at changes that you have made before making a decision. 
Another is also, how do you make decision, right? Like, what does it look like? If someone has made decision before you, why was that decision made? So, you know, having a note of history, why things change the way they changed. So I'm telling you some problems, not because it's a bad thing to do. It's something that we need to consider when we are trying to build a collaborative project. So these are some things that we already talked about. The first answer we Andre gave was versions, right? Like how do we manage those versions? And especially, uh, especially to avoid what Yo was talking about, random naming of the files. Can we have just one name and stick with it and go back to history in some sensible manner? So you've already seen it, right? Like in your Google Doc or someone said uh, Microsoft Teams, you have folders. These folders have different set of files. These files have some content written on it. So just imagine you're this beautiful fox who wrote multiple things in that file. Um, what actually is happening that even though you're writing these files, there is a history that's being stored. So for example, you came back three days later, you edited something in, you came back the next day, you came in and read something that didn't fit very well. So you removed some, some lines that shows in red minus or added some line, which is plus. And all these information, they are being recorded in that file because you can click on this link that says go back in version or say what changed. You would be able to see what has changed over a period of time. So you're not storing them in, in multiple file, you're storing just one single file. Just have these ability to go back in time because these different document tool that you're using have that capacity built in. So this is what it looks like that you have these time points which are shown in zero or circle. Uh, you add a file, you remove something, you edit something in, and there is a linear history in our, in our, in our mind that are different revisions and versions. Version control just doesn't allow you to go forward in time, but it also should allow you to go back in time. Let's say you made some changes and most of your team member didn't agree with it. You should go back to a version. Um, but when you, for example, coding, everything goes well and suddenly there is an error and your program fails. It doesn't mean that your software is unusable now. You can go back to the time when it last worked where there was no bug. So the capacity of version is not just go forward in time, but should be able to go back in time. So this is the classic example of naming. If we think about storing different formats of file in a haphazard way without any standard naming, it just doesn't allow your collaborators to understand what is happening. Maybe you don't understand six months down the line, but version control actually allows you to have different versions stored as we saw uh, without this problem of renaming the file. So yeah, basically going back in time, I'm just repeating myself. Uh, so you've seen already, uh, as we talked about that Google Drive does it, Microsoft does it, um, but there's another more uh, stronger version control system called Git that does it locally. We will not cover Git here, uh, but that's something that you might wanna learn about later in time when you feel a bit more confident with uh, how GitHub works. GitHub and Git are very, uh, they, they don't need to be connected. You can do local version control without having to push changes online. However, these are um, always done online. So now think about this collaborative standard version. This is still you who has done some changes. In, in ideal world, you would like anybody to have access to the file that you're working on at the same time that we see in the etherpad that different people can come in and write. We have a way to understand who's doing what kind of changes um, and allow those changes or even track back. So if I can quickly show you how that works in the etherpad, so that's that's the etherpad that you're looking at. In that etherpad, you have this symbol, which is history. It should load. So you see that there are major changes done here, but you can literally scroll back and forth in order to go back to different versions. So this is also version control, which is good to know because um, you can always revive a version that was most important to you or has all the most important information. So that's a background, which I know I'm repeating because you've already heard about it. You understand now what version control is. So why do we want to 
teach you what GitHub is. So this is not the free software. This is a, a, a platform which is hosted by Microsoft, but it allows us to create different repository where we can store our code and share with people. So you can have version control file locally, push them online in GitHub, and other people all around the world would be able to see what you see locally in your own computer. It hosts your repository, allows people to work with it. It, is, it has a web interface. So if you're not a coder, don't wanna work in, in the local terminal, you still are able to collaborate with people and access all that functionality of version control. And it has also features of project management, which we will not see today, but in one of the upcoming cohort call, uh, we might be able to look at that. And then finally, it's useful for any project where people are working together. It doesn't have to be code. It could be document. It could be a paper that you're building together. It could be anything that requires version control. So I want to pause for a second and see uh, that you all actually have a GitHub account. So if you can give me a thumbs up. If you do, great, great. And if you don't, maybe take a minute to create that. So I have hands of, uh, thumbs up from most of you, which I'm gonna assume that you actually have GitHub. If you don't, um, okay, great. So I have actually now, yes, from everybody. So that's perfect. So that's, that's hurdle passed. If you have an account, can you all please sign in already um, and, and come to a place where you're able to see your profile? Because we're gonna do a bit of demo for you. At this point, I'm gonna actually hand it to you. Thanks, Marvika. Um, and Kim, for your question, now we're just gonna use the web interface today, so you don't need to have anything downloaded. Um, your website will be fine. Um, okay, so I'm gonna quickly walk through some slides talking about how the demo works, and then I'm gonna also go through it again, but on the web interface, so that you can watch it twice just to follow along. Um, let's do the sharey thing, share screen, share, okie dokie. So the exercise that we're looking at today um, is just very short, we're going to create a new repository, which is to say, think of repository as a project, um, no, a place to store something that could be, like Movika mentioned, documents, it could be code, it could be something else. Now GitHub is code oriented, which means that it sort of defaults to assuming that you're writing code, but um, you don't have to write code to do so. Um, so very briefly, I can make this a little bit bigger, can't I? No, well, that's making it smaller when I say make it bigger, that's logical. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so. Momentary brain freeze, let's try that again. Um, over here, this is the create a new repository page on GitHub. I'm going to highlight a few things. One is we're going to create a repository each. Um, so we're going to suggest naming it friendly-collab-party, but really you can name it anything you like. It could be like my OLS project. Um, but the reason we use friendly collab party is just a way of using a nice quick throwaway repository that you can delete afterwards if you wish to do so. Um, there is a description line that you can add in, and this will just say, um, like, it means if someone else is coming along and looking at your repository, they'll know what they're looking at. So, for example, for the OLS website, you might say something like website for openlifesci.org. Um, and these two buttons here, again, I'll go through this again on the screen in a moment. There's public and there's private. Um, so you can choose private, but given that the idea is that we're looking at open working, it makes sense in this case to have it public. Um, and there's also checkboxes where you can choose to initialize the repository with a readme um, and also to add a license. So we'll step through those on the other screen in a moment. Um, but once you've created your first repository, that's a bit fuzzy. I'm just going to go straight <laughs> to um, the main GitHub repo. OK, so um, what I'm going to do here, if you, let me, let me, oh, this one will get bigger. I bet you can read this now. Um, <laughs> So over here on the top left, um, when I just go plain on to github.com, I'm logged in, which is why it looks like this. Um, but there's a nice little green button here that says new. I click on new. Um, I don't want any templates. And I'm going to give it the name, like I mentioned earlier, friendly-collab 
dash party and we'll use this for the exercises in the future if like me you have run this exercise a few times and it says no no this repo exists you might have to choose another name i will choose funky collab party okay um so once again i mentioned you can add a description so this is just going to be github exercise demo repo i'm going to choose that it's public so that people can see this on the internet uh, particularly this is important because we're going to be interacting with one another and if i put it as private you can't see it and you won't be able to contribute and collaborate and when you're trying to do pull requests on each other's things which we may cover at the end uh, if we have time then you need it to be public uh, so I'm going to choose add a readme file. Um, so we talked in our previous cohort call about why readmes are useful. It's a description of what you're doing in your uh, repository and telling people how to get involved. Um, ignore the git ignore. This is largely if you have, um, if you're using it on your desktop and you have template files that you don't want to check in. Like for example, when I'm using a Mac, a lot of my folders have a file called DS store um, and no one wants to see that. Um, but don't worry if you don't know what that means either. Just checking quickly the chat. Can it be changed to public later? Yes, it can. Um, you can flip between the two at any given time as much as you wish. It could confuse people uh, if suddenly a repository disappears, for example, but there's nothing stopping you doing it. Can I suggest for this exercise to actually keep it public because we will ask you to convert that into website and if you have it private, you can't do that. Perfect. Um, and choosing a license. We talked about that earlier when um, also in the previous cohort call. <laughs> yes, um, in, in theory, you can flip between as much as you wish. Um, or for example, if there's something that you're not ready to show to the world for some reason, um, then you can keep it private until it's ready to be public. Um, one thing to note in that sort of case is that when something is um, private and then you turn it public, people can still see the history from before you made it public because you can still rewind the timeline. So don't, um, for example, like put stuff that should never be public and then make it public when you've changed it because even though you can't see it right now, if you rewind time, you'll still see the old version. Uh, so just something to be, to be aware of. Um, right, choosing a license. So um, if you're not doing code, you probably don't wanna use any of the default licenses they have here. Um, because these are all code specific mm -hmm. licenses and it has provisions around running the code, um, which if you're not doing code doesn't make a bunch of sense. Um, you can use Creative Commons licenses, for example, Creative Commons Zero, that is a good license for data. Um, it doesn't have the option to select, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cre uh, other Creative Commons licenses, but those are the ones that we'd recommend for, for example, for writing. Don't worry about that too much right now. Um, I'm going to make mine CCO. That just means anyone can reuse it for any purpose. And I will click Create Repository. Cool. Okay. Now you can see it's automatically created that license here. So if I click on this, it just says anyone can basically do anything they want with it within reason. Um, and you can see the README. There is just the description and the title here. Um, what else am I going to describe at this point? Is there anything else? Not yet. <laughs> OK, right. I'm going to stop sharing and just suggest everyone go through and make your own friendly and or funky collab party repo and then perhaps use the reactions button to put a little green check once you're you've done. Um, Joe, I had created the repository while you were explaining it on just your, um, uh, while you were like sharing the screen, but not the actual website, that website. So I actually didn't press, I uh, didn't like check the creator with me and the license. Can I add them? Can I add these options now? Yeah. How can I'll I do that? Screen share and show how I would do oh, that. Yeah. Um, so what you can do if you don't have a readme okay. here yeah. mm. is um, just click on add file uh, okay. and click yep. create and read me um, and then it, it should create it. Uh, so if, if I put some stuff here, it won't let me do this because I already have a readme. You have one, yeah. You'd be able to save here. Okay. 
Great, thanks. And for the license? Same thing, um, so create a file. And actually right. when you type license in here, um, mm -hmm. it will give you, there we go. It says choose a license template and it will actually let you choose one if, if so you wish to do. So it's quite oh, sneaky okay. and smart. All right, great, thanks. Okay, I think we have green checks from most people. Um, Jesse, I just want to double check you're doing okay. Okay, if there's anything we can do to help, uh, let us know. Hello. I, hey, I just want you to I wanted to check if you you were still Hello, following. You? Yes. Are you following and doing okay? Yes, it's okay. Fantastic. Okay, how do I clear? It used to be possible to clear all of the statuses. Ah, clear all feedback. Found it. Okay. Right. Um, let me see. Right, I'm going to go back to screen sharing, my friends. Okay, congratulations. You have created your first repository and here is the world's happiest flower. Um, so now we're going to talk about Markdown. Um, so this is what you can use to actually start creating uh, your own website. And Markdown is designed as a formatting method that allows you to um, well, yeah, create uh, certain types of formats, specifically bold, um, italic, headings, links, and a few other things. Um, and if you've ever used a HackMD document, which some of you may have, for example, for uh, mentor mentee notes, then you may have already been using Markdown. Um, but what I will do is I will create a tiny little demo. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my funky collaboration party and I'm going to edit my README and show this Markdown that we have here. So first thing, um, and when you're looking at that preview here, you can see that this is quite large text and this is smaller. So if we go back to clicking on edit file, you can see that the difference is that I have a hash or a pound sign here in front of the header um, and I don't in front of the next line. So the hash, uh, the pound sign is uh, what makes this big. And that's what's called a level one heading. I could also add a level two heading. And then if I go and look at my preview again, you can see it's slightly smaller and is it, it, I'm imagining you can probably follow along what will happen if I had three hash signs or four hash signs. It goes all the way down to six. Someone decided six was enough. Probably it is. And if you actually get all the way down to six, I'd be surprised. But in theory, that's how many headings you can have and subheadings when you're creating this. So I could say is a really low level heading and should be able to see that here and you can see the formatting changes a little bit to sort of suggest that it's a subheading but you might say cool i've got headings what else can i do so some of the fun bits and pieces that you can do for formatting is you might say this is a list and if i go back it's automatically created bullet points for that list um, in an unordered list, or you might say that actually the order of what I'm adding is actually really important. So I'm going to write some of the most important things for me in, an, in a list. Let's make this a heading, important things, one, cats, two, chocolate, three, I need a suggestion here folks, I've run out. Okay, I can see lots of grins. Hey. 
sunlight given the uh, northern hemisphere deficiency. yes absolutely cats chocolate and sunlight just don't combine them because otherwise you'll have a very brown cat um right and so now if i go and i look at my preview it has in fact ordered them but it's very intelligent so let's say someone else comes in and edits this and I say I've actually thought about something else really important which is um, I really really also like violets uh, but I can't be bothered renumbering this oh my god it auto renumbered this <laughs> I'm trying to demo something and it's automatically filling the numbers for me what I was going to try to do to say I didn't want to renumber this was just put a random number in here I add in violets because they are lovely flowers and the formatting does this funky little thing where it automatically knows that if I don't want to have to go and renumber all those numbers when I've got a long list, then it'll still correctly process it into the correct number of numbers. Um, I may want to write simple paragraph texts. And so I'll go back and say, this is an amazing paragraph. Uh, but I need to emphasize amazing and have people know just how amazing my paragraph is. So I'm going to put an underscore around the word amazing. And it's already hinting at what it's going to do. If I switch to the preview, you'll see that it has in fact become italics. Uh, I'd also like some bold. So for that, I'm going to use two underscores. Or you could also use stars. It does the same thing. Um, so I could just use star star to make that bold. Um, and so when you go to the preview, it's removed all of the formatting marks, but it automatically formats it nicely. Uh, the final thing I think I'll show is links, which can be very useful because you might want more than one page. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to get, an, ah, images, I forgot about images. Okay, there's two things to show. I'm going to link to an image. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find a nice image. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to link to one of my favorite images. If I right click on this and I click on copy image link, I should now be able to embed this. Uh, go. So here is a link to an image. So what I've done here is the text that I want to be linked, I've put square brackets around. Uh, and then after that, I put the link that I want it to link to. So I've done that in a round bracket. I've pasted in the link that I want to link to, which is the OLS logo, and done that in round brackets. So the text here, in square brackets followed by the image that it should link to. Now if I go and I preview this, click on preview, and you can see it has underlined. So if I click on that, I'm going to open a new tab. My zoom controls are covering my tabs, which is really annoying. <laughs> uh, okay, and you can see it's linked to that image. And then the final question is, okay, I've linked to images, but what if I wanted to embed an image? make my page really beautiful. And it's very, very, very similar, but slight difference. So I'm just pasting the same line again. And rather than having a link to an image in front of this, I add an exclamation mark. Um, and what happens here is that this becomes the alt text when you hover over it or the screen readers read, um, screen readers read instead. So rather than saying link to image, I'm going to say image of OLS logo. And now one more time, back to that preview. Scroll down. Oh, okay, that was big. I didn't know it was going to be that big. Um, but also, if I hover over it, does it show? It doesn't show the alt text, but trust me, it's what a screen reader would see. It would say image of OLS logo if the screen reader was looking at it. So it's always important to include that as well. Um, let me see if there's any comments or questions. <laughs> it was an open source contribution for the um, from Hectoberfest for that logo. Uh, it's all about about all I have on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions at the moment? I know I've been talking and showing lots of little Cody bits, and you might have questions. Or can you show me this again?
all super, super clear. Amazing, I love this. Okay, right, what do we do next? I think we have, ah, we have a um, task. What is a task? Right. I think it's basically just go and add your vision statement to your readme and give a little bit of formatting in your readme. Uh, we could do this in breakout rooms, but I think we're a very small group, so it might be okay just to mute and then unmute if you have any questions. Reasonably clear? Cool, cool. And uh, Biandri, yes, you could upload an image uh, into your GitHub repository um, and link to it that way as well. Show again how to add an image, I will do. In fact, I'll paste it into chat. Ah, I think it's even faster than me. Three points to the first person who says something weird's happening that I didn't expect, by the way. Me. <laughs> so I was trying to put a heading. Uh, and, oh, yeah, no, I think I got it. Yeah, because I was trying to put the uh, stars for bold together with the hashtag, but then the hash key, sorry. But, um, but yeah, maybe the, the stars were not necessary because I got in my preview now i got ash key open science open future which is the name of my project and which was supposed to be the text for the heading but i don't want the ash to show so let me try this so ash key space open science yeah okay, got it fantastic cool Thanks. this is a, <laughs> this is the best thing about debugging with people when you explain your problem you you know what is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rubber yeah. duck <laughs> All right. If your readme is at a, sta a stage where you're happy with it, post a link in the chat um, or just give us the green check if that's easier.
Nice shout out then there, uh, Kim, about the usage rights filter of finding an image that you're allowed to share with other people. It's a reason I also like using Flickr, because uh, you can choose to, use, to search only for Creative Commons licensed images that you're allowed to therefore reuse. I love what you're doing. <laughs> Someone can come in and say, I love what you're doing, and I'm going to make a copy for myself. And that would that act of copying for myself would be forking. But someone can also just be working with you in a repository and they don't make a copy for themselves, but they make a copy within your repository. So you can continue working on what you're working on and they can make changes. And that would be called branching. So we won't be looking at the branching today. We will be looking at forking today where instead of someone working with you within the repository, actually someone externally coming in, creates a fork of your repository, make some changes. So what I will do, I have a copy of Yul's repository. So if you wanna also do that, I'm gonna send you a link, or maybe you can send you the link. So I can look at it because it's a public repository. And I said, oh, interesting. That looks like a file that I wanna have because I have few important things to add. Um, and then you see on the top, there is a link which, is, which says fork. Don't do this, you can do it too, but we will actually give you a proper exercise to do. So I can click on the fork and you should not have all these things. And I would be able to create a copy of that in my own repository. So while it's copying, you can see that, that GitHub is indeed quite slow today. So you can see that there is, there used to be Yo's repository, but Malvika made a copy of that in her own account. And it appears that it's been forked from Yo's, Yo's account. So it does not matter what Yo does in her repository or I do in my repository, unless we interact with each other, it's our own personal copies. So a lot of time people build software in GitHub repository that you might wanna use um, and you can create a fork of that um, and vice versa. Someone else can come in and create a fork of that, which is why licensing is so important because if I am gonna use what you're working on, I should be respecting the license. So if, you, if instead of CC zero, you can replace the copy um, content and license with CC 4.0, which would mean that if I use anything that you have developed, I would say uh, it should be attributed correctly. And I should be able to make my own copy. For example, I don't have to worry about telling you anything. Um, I can add a small title for this. I can go directly and commit changes that we talked about. And what I would see in my own repository that the readme file has updated by adding this information. But now if I go back to use repository, that information doesn't exist because the change that I made was in my personal copy and not in use copy. So this is how you see that we made a fork, people can continue working on their own repository and they do not interact and that's completely fine. But there could be some scenario where, where I actually want to interact and I want to tell you that there is a change and that act of telling her would be called, um, so I'm gonna move on, would be called pull request. So now I actually want you to test what pull request means. I'm going to do a little bit of introduction and give you a, an exercise, which would not be in Yale's repository. It would be in Open Life Science repository. So if you don't own a repo, meaning that if you haven't created it, you are not an official collaborator in there. You can create a fork of the repository. You can work in your local copy. But if you want to interact with those people who have originally created the repository, you need to make a pull request to let them know that there are some changes that you have made and you would like them to accept it as a part of their own repository. And when you do that, they can either accept it, reject it, help you improve it. It could be anything. Um, so that pull request would mean that you made a copy, you created a change, 
and you're going to merge it back into the main repository. So for that, I will ask you to, I'll send you a link that would be over less five. So there is a repository we are going to maintain for you. You have seen it already because we asked you to create issue for your own um, project. If you haven't created an issue for your own project, you'll probably will come back to it and do it. We are in the week five. Within the week five, we have a note. And in this note, we have transferred the document that we have in the etherpad and we've added your name. So what I want to want you to do, and at this point you can actually go along and do it with me if I send you this link. So that's the link. You should be able to see exactly what I'm seeing. I'm going to edit this file. I'm not gonna fork it. I'm gonna edit this file directly. And when I do that, um, oh, it, it would not do it for me because I am officially a collaborator. But folks, can you try doing this with me and tell me what you see, right? If you click on this, you should see exactly what you're seeing. I'm gonna ask you to scroll down and next to your name, so I have my name in line 68 for Lizanne, it would be 59. I'm going to add my answer from Etherpad, um, which is cherry blossoms and magnolia. So I would ask you all to edit next to your own name. Do not edit anywhere else. Uh, it, it, at this point, at least, because it will create some conflict, which we don't want to get into. But please do add you as well. Uh, and we, what we will do is that when you scroll down, instead of this, it will ask you to propose change. This is not a really good example. I, I totally understand this. But I would ask you to let me know what you see. Do you see proposed changes? Yeah. All right. So. What I will ask you to do is actually do exactly that, propose changes, because you're not an official collaborator on this repository. I am, unfortunately for this exercise, I am an official collaborator. But in your case, you, you should see that, propose change. Here it says Malvika Sharan patch one. You can leave that. It, it should say your username and patch one, or you can edit this. And I'm going to edit this as Malvika name. Oh, well, sorry, Malvika branch, because I'm creating a branch and you all are creating a branch as well. Um, here I will be, I'll add my name, adding my answer. You can also do that. It, could, it should be a little bit explanatory. So if someone else she sees that they understand what you're doing and you can add a bit more context. Uh, this is a demo, so you don't have a lot of context to add, but uh, in real case scenario, you would have probably a lot of information to add. Adding my answer here as it is on Etherpad. And with that, I'm happy. I'm going to propose change. It should bring me to this place where I will create a pull request. So what has happened in your case is that you went into Open Life Science repository, you started editing a file, and because you're not a collaborator, it has automatically created a fork in the similar way as I had uh, created a fork for your account. And then it asks you to propose change because you can't edit the file directly. You created a branch within that and then <laughs> Pull request. I, as I speak, I understand how many new words are in there, and I don't feel very comfortable without explaining. But the end goal is that you should have this exact pull request created. Just to simulate exactly what you did. So just imagine this is Open Life Science repository. What you did is you had a file, you went into editing that file. I add OLS in there, important things. 
And similar to what you might have seen, instead of asking me to create a branch, it asked me to propose changes. Um, adding one more important thing, propose changes. When I try to propose change, it asked me to create pull request. I can add more information if I need to share. So this is the interaction that I'm having with people. So I, I need to be as elaborative as possible. The better my explanation is, the easier for person to review. And then I create a pull request. This is what you all have seen, hopefully in OLS. So if I go back to, to OLS, I click on pull request. There is one pull request that I created, but we also have someone else who created a pull request. So I'm gonna go and click on that and see what's happening in there. So I see that's Vianne where you would see that there is one commit, that, that means we have done one change. I can go in here and look at what file has changed and I see, oh, there was a name before. Now I have actually a bit more information from them. And that's basically is pull request that Vianne made. As a reviewer, I can actually review it and make changes if I want, but to not complicate it, the easiest way for me is to say, ah, thank you for, for that update. I am happy to approve this. So when I say I'm happy to approve this, I actually have to approve this and I'll submit review. And the submit review is only an action for me saying that all these information look great. In some cases, it could be that, oh, I do not like something in, in there. Can you make a change? And you can continue doing multiple conversation until you're happy to approve this. And here, either you, Bernice, Amy, or I can merge the pull request. None of you can. So similar to that, I think you would be able to approve this. So in this case, you don't see for me, there is no approval because I own, I do not own the other project. So before I merge this, I would ask folks to also create this pull request as Beandre has. So just coming back to what you are supposed to do, I shared a link to this file with you. I ask you to click on edit this file. You would scroll down. And next to your name, you will add the information that you've added in Etherpad. You can make it up. You don't need to share the right information here. It's a test file. And once you're happy with the edit that you've done, you will scroll down. You will propose change. So I'm going to scroll down as well. You will propose change. It will show you. It will bring you to pull request. And once you get there, please give me a thumbs up. And if, you, if that was unclear, we can walk you through. Um, as well. Hi, Pauline. Well. Hi, sorry. Um, did I miss the meeting? I was supposed to join. Pauline, Sorry. I don't think you were supposed to join this. No, I, I, I invited ah. her. I invited oh, okay. her. Um, but I think we might have had time zone mix up because um, we're nearly done. <laughs> Got about 10 more minutes, I'm afraid, Polly. It's okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just sorry uh. you missed it. So you, can you share and show Kim how you how you can actually do more edits? So rather than merging my pull request, ah, uh, go ahead if you if you would like to. So Kim had asked, could you show an example where you request further change? So rather than approving, can you show if you had to ask me to change more? Uh, so can you see my screen? Yep, okay. 
I have Malvika's, um, here, Malvika's option here. I'm going to go to Files Changed. Um, this is on the top right tab. And I'm going to review. And quite frankly, Malvika, I have to say I'm disapp disappointed that um, you haven't talked about any of the animals that you've seen when you've been out walking. Um, so that's simple request changes and I can click submit review and that now appears um, with a request to change things. If you're feeling really excitable and there's a specific line that you don't like, you can also go over here and look at this plus over here. Sorry, I jumped. This is in files changed again. You can click on the plus over here and I'm going to suggest what I think Malvika should have done. Um, and to do that, I click on this one, add a suggestion, and it automatically finds the line that I've highlighted and brings it up for me. Um, and it surrounds it in the word suggestion, which I ignore, but basically it tells GitHub to know that I'm suggesting what should be there. Um, so I'm looking and there's cherry blossoms and there's magnolia. Um, and as I can't believe that you didn't see any of the wonder of the little green parrots that were flying to your window. And so I'm going to, I could start a review if I have lots and lots of comments. I'm not going to, I only have one comment for today. So I'm going to add a single comment. Um, and now Malvika can see this as a suggestion that she should also add little green parrots. Um, and Malvika, I think you can commit that, can't you? So I'm going to wait and see if that gets responded to. You're on mute still, I'm afraid. Sorry. So you can see my uh, screen because this is what I look at now. So you reviewed my pull request and you made a suggestion. So if I want, I can just directly, because I I think that's perfect. I can go directly and say, um, I can say thank you for politeness, but you don't need to. If, if you're working with people, you don't think that formality is needed, but it's always nice, right? So I can commit change by clicking on this. When I commit change, it should directly get merged in the file. So if I click on the file, it shows me, okay, that line has been updated, not just with the thing that I did, but also what you added. And at this point, maybe you a day later looks at it and I'm gonna stop sharing so you can share and show um, how to approve. Now you're you're on mute, <laughs> but I think it makes sense. There we go. Okay, it took me so long to even figure out how to unmute. Um, I, I said many witty things. Trust me. Um, so anyway, I I have viewed these new changes that I have seen um, that made up. I can see that Malvika now agrees that she should in fact have Joyce little green parrots on her list. And so I'm not even going to bother reviewing this time. Uh, reviewing is optional. It's merely useful. Very often, I think we're good. We've made the changes. So I'm just going to say let's let's merge this really good now you've covered the basic stuff i'm going to click confirm merge and that is now live so if i go and click on code and look at week five and look at the notes there we go we have everything that we have incorporated here and really quickly in the last six minutes i'm going to try and merge some of these let's try let's add okay no conflicts i love no conflicts thank you beandre i'm going to merge this confirm merge looking good i'm going to go to the next one see how many we can get without conflicts 
adding my answer to the icebreaker, thinking no conflicts. This is great. So if I take a quick peek at the code now, we've added two more lines in week five and in the notes. And it's long. Look at that, we've got sparrows. Oh, I hope it was safe and that you got it out okay. Um, and we've got sunsets and let's see if we can merge if this is the first time if we get them all merged in this will be the first time that we have ever managed to merge them all without ah here we go <laughs> it always happens so if people edit the same line at some point it might even be just a space or a dot or something really tiny then you get these conflicts where you need to um resolve them i'm gonna see probably it won't be too hard to resolve when you've got lots and lots of work it gets harder which is one reason to make little commits because you lose less if something goes wrong and um, because it makes the re resolving the conflicts much easier. Um, I didn't click that, whatever happened, that was my cat typing on my touchpad. Um, what's happened? What have you done, kitty cat? Um, Mariangela, conflict. Oh, did you, did you resolve it, Malvika? I resolved it, yeah. Okay, right. Um, any more to merge? Oh, yeah, I'm gonna just walk through the resolve. Right, okay. So what it sees here is somehow, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's fussing, but the good thing is as a human, I can tell what's going on, even if the computer is confused. So I can see that here we have one, um, from Jasia, and here we have one from Kim, and the I can actually intelligently combine those. So if you see here is where um, one version starts, here's where it ends, and here's where the other version ends. So dump the cat down because he's interrupting everything. Thank you, sweetie. Um, I'm just gonna manually my keyboard. <laughs> move my keyboard because of a cat. Um, nothing like professional and organized things here. Right, so delete all those. And I just need to remove that and get them in order. Oop. Right, so now that looks good. I've resolved it to my satisfaction manually. I'm gonna scroll. No, where is that? Where's the button to accept this? It is. Mark is resolved. resolved. Here we go. It's this one over here. Click on that. Once again, I have to commit it. And then I merge it. Once I've done the commit where I um, resolve the merge conflict, click on confirm. And it should be all live and beautiful. Let's admire the page. Click five notes. And we did it. Amazing. Okay. I, I'm just gonna drop this in the chat. Here's one I prepared earlier. This is actually OLS3 that I um, did a friendly collab party, not a funky collab party, but that's what it would look like if, um, if, if GitHub Pages was working nicely. Um, okay, we have two minutes left. Mavika, is there anything else to cover? Let's see. Uh, I think we can just use that last two minutes to hear if you have any question. And you can always come back to these um, slides if you get stuck anywhere or ask in Slack. Like our OLS community love answering GitHub questions, like any GitHub question, just give them something. So if you have any question, just do ask it on the Slack. Um, but if you have any question right now, please tell us because all of these are confusing. You wouldn't see the use of that immediately, but it would make sense one day. And if you want to test more editing, make as many changes as you want in OLS website. You have your profile up there. If you want to write a post, or if you want to just play around with this particular file that's given you. But yeah, please do ask question. Uh, what we would do is stop recording. <laughs>